Several years ago, I had the opportunity to do an interview with a man by the name of Joe Godfrey, who spent close to two decades in prison following a tragic accident in which Mr. Godfrey became intoxicated, got behind the wheel of a car, and tragically hit a family head-on late one night. The consequences were absolutely horrendous, not only to Joel and, and his family, but also for the innocent victims who died so tragically in a night to never forget. So stay with us, and we'll be back in just a moment as we present a program that you're not going to want to miss. I guarantee it. In Him, all families are blessed. Join our discussion on Fabric of Family. Most of us have probably heard warnings about the danger of alcohol and its negative effects upon the family. However, in today's program, we're going to watch an interview that I conducted with Joel Godfrey a, a few years ago regarding his struggles with alcohol and the events that led to that tragic night that he'll never forget. I can assure you that the interview that you're going to watch today is going to move you, perhaps cause you to even shed some tears as you watch it. But hopefully our program is going to help someone to never make the same mistake that left so many people with a lifetime of regrets. Uh, Joe, why would you want to uh, sit down and discuss things that are of such a sensitive uh, nature as uh, your own personal life? Well, I've had a lot of time over the years to think uh, upon the mistakes that I've made. Mm -hmm. And I would like to say anything possible to reach anyone out there that faces similar problems, similar mm -hmm. uh, problems with alcohol or drugs mm -hmm. or uh, that they may see something in me mm -hmm. and something that ha has happened to me that they may want to correct their situation before it reaches the point that mine has. Okay. Joe, let me ask you this question. Are you an alcoholic? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. How long have uh, you dealt uh, with this as a personal struggle in your life? Well, I, I think I first realized that uh, I, I was first able to admit, I say, that in 1987 that I had a problem. And, but before then, I think inside, deep down, I knew. Yeah. I, I was uh, raised by a Christian mother. She raised me in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Yeah. But when I reached the age of 16, I went away with the ways of the world. Mm -hmm. I went with what was popular at school, and I drifted away. Yeah. And from that point, I went to, when I graduated high school, I went to, into the Air Force. And we all know that the military is strong on drinking and uh, everybody, uh, it's just a way of life in the military. And I think uh, I had a few problems there, nothing that caused me severe problems, but I did have some problems there. But when I got out of the Air Force, I stayed in there six years, and when I come home, uh, I know that alcoholism, it caused me some problems, like in my marriage, and, uh, but I also want everyone to know that uh, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, people have this stigmatism of people that uh, they're gutter drunks, they just stay drunk 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but that's not the case. You know, alcohol, you can be an alcoholic and you can only drink on the weekends or the evenings a little bit here and there, but you know, it, it doesn't take somebody to be drunk every day or drinking every day to, to be an alcoholic. And I think that's a, a misconception that a lot of people have, they, and they may say, well, I, I'm not an alcoholic. I, you know, I'm, I, I'm not uh, someone who's, uh, uh, who goes to bed drinking, who wakes up and begins to drink. Right. But uh, I think that's a very valid point that that alcohol and alcoholism uh, is something that uh, takes hold of a person and a lot of times they don't even realize it. Exactly. Uh, you know, in the beginning, like I said, uh, in high school, you know, I grew up 
when I was a teenager, it was in the 70s. It was during the time of the, you know, the hippies and those kinds of things. And it was the thing to do, you know. It was, uh, and I think that's how I got drawn away into it. And begin as a recreational thing. But as you get older and the longer you drink, you, you begin to use it as dealing with problems. And uh, it's a crutch. It, it becomes a crutch for you. And you just don't realize that transition from recreation to it being a crutch on you. And I, I know it caused me a problem. The first time, like I said, that I realized that it was really caused me a problem was that I had went through a divorce. And uh, my drinking became heavier. And at that time, a couple of incidents happened yeah. that made me ashamed. It, it, it truly made me ashamed. And I realized that I needed some some type of help or or, or make some effort mm -hmm. toward trying to stop. And in 1987, did I did uh, I entered myself into a rehabilitation program, a 28-day program. That program lasted, uh, and w it was a very good program. Mm -hmm. But it lasted me uh, maybe two to two and a half years, and. The reason I think it worked was that I separated myself from the people that I'd been around, the, the, the kind of life that I had lived. And when, it, when I relapsed, it was because that I had relocated. And when I did, I was back around those same people again. And it didn't take me very long until I was right back into the same thing again. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about uh, the companions that we choose. Exactly. And, uh, you know, the companions we choose a lot of times uh, can have an influence on the decisions that we make. And as I listen to you talk, that's uh, uh, what I sense that you're, you're saying. Some of the, uh, the choices that you made were easier to make because of the people you were around. Mm -hmm. Exactly. In retrospect, I look back and I can see, I can remember my mom telling me mm -hmm. that as a teenager that I was... I would hang with people that, you know, they had not been raised in the church. They, they didn't really know any better. Yeah. They thought that was a way of life because their parents had raised them that it was okay. Yeah. And they didn't have a conscience. Things didn't bother them like they bothered me. Yeah. And she said it'll always be that way because you know better, because you were raised better. And I, I didn't pay much attention to it then, but I, when I look back, yeah. She was so right. And oftentimes, you know, we don't, we don't listen to our parents. No. Uh, as teenagers, you know, we think that we, we've got a pretty good feel of everything. And, uh, you know, we know how the world uh, reacts and we know how we're going to react to the world. But that's not the way it is. It's it? not. And, and if I could, and, you know, just like the majority of my adult life, mm -hmm. if I could go back, I'd, I'd give anything just to <laughs> pay yeah. attention and, and do exactly yeah. what she said. But. Yeah. I was stubborn, I was a teenager, and I thought I knew it all. Yeah. And it just, when you look back and, and you're so sad because you see what your life has become mm. because, well, because of stubbornness, because of disrespect for uh, the laws of the land, disrespect for God's law, mm. and, and that's totally what it amounts to. Yeah. Now, you said in uh, 1987 you... Uh, acknowledge that you, you had a problem uh, yes. uh, with alcohol. And of course, uh, uh, to consume any amount of alcohol is, is something that's problematic from the scriptures. Right. Uh, but I know what you mean by that. You meant that uh, you acknowledge that you were addicted to, to alcohol. That yes. can happen, can it not? Yes. And you get to thinking, uh, especially like I said, when I grew up in the 70s, you know, that was the thing to do. You get to thinking after uh, that you can't have a good time without it, mm -hmm. that that's the only way that you can possibly have a good time. You forget, uh, you know, I forgot what I had been, I had learned, you know. I, but when I think back now, then when my mom had raised me in the Lord's Church and I had uh, been active as a, as a young man in young converts class. You know, you were talking a while ago that uh, you mentioned that you didn't know if I'd ever preached or not. Yeah. But we, I remember when I was 15 at Highland, yeah. 
uh, we had a young converts class, and they had the young men lead. And I did stand behind that pulpit when I was 15 years old. Scared to death, but I, I stood behind that pulpit. Yeah. And she, my mom, I, I couldn't do enough for her now. She, she was the backbone of our family. Yeah. And she, she raised three boys in the nurture and admonition of the Lord just as the best she could. And later won my dad to Christ. And later in years after I, I had become an adult, mm -hmm. he surrendered his will and his life to the care of God. And just through her faithfulness and obedience, then you know, she's been an inspiration to us all. Still is today. Yeah. Well, I know you've had uh, a lot of uh, struggles and difficulties, as you said, with alcohol. And, uh, you know, one of the things I'd like to, uh, to talk about at this time, uh, let you share with us, I I'd like for you to allow your mind to drift back just a bit to uh, uh, the month of July. The day is the 25th of July, 1990. Yes. Now, Joel, uh, tell us about the events leading up to that particular day. Right. That's a very uh, sorrowful day for me. Uh, it was a every, just everyday occurrence. I had gotten up that morning. I had went to work. I had worked all day. I, afterward, I understood that they were having a, a get-together for this fella, and they wanted me to come by. I was invited to come by. So we came by, and of course there was drinking going on, and I had had some drinks. And I think I left the uh, get together around 12 o'clock or a little before 12. And, and uh, I made a judgment call that night, a judgment call that cost lives of people. It ruined my life. And you, you, got, you got behind the wheel. Yes. Uh, on your way home that uh, night. Right. Knowing that I should not, uh, not not really thinking about it at the moment because mm. when 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 you're under an influence you you lose your inhibitions you you're not thinking clearly you think you think kind of like what you did when you were a teenager that you know everything that it's okay yeah. but I did get behind the wheel and on the way home I think I was less than a mile and a half away from my house and I dozed off at the wheel and you know like I say I, I'd had a long day and I'd had a few drinks, and that aided in the fact of, of what happened. I had an accident. I call it accident, but it was out of stupidity, a, a, a decision that I made that was stupid. It was r irresponsible, and it resulted in, in deaths of others. And it was, it's a devastating night for those, those people that perished in the accident. It's a devastating night for the, the vicarious victims, uh, the mothers, the fathers, the brothers, sisters, the children that, that will be with them the rest of their lives as, just as I live with it each day. Now, Joel, you, had, you said you had this accident. Um, and of course, uh, I know that you, you were involved in a car wreck. Yes. And uh, as you indicated, uh, there were some innocent people that were, were killed. Yes. Um, what's the first thing that you remember after the accident? I actually don't remember the impact because, like I said, I, I dozed at the wheel. Yeah. And it was just in a split second, many lives were taken and, and changed in that split second. It only takes one second. And I remember waking up at the hospital, and I knew something bad had happened. I mean, they were working on me, and I remember two hospital security guys standing over me, and I couldn't understand why they were standing there. Yeah. Because at that moment, I had a concussion. I couldn't remember exactly what had went on. And I think I stayed there most of the night, and around 7, 30, 8 o'clock that morning, I was still laying on the gurney, and a police officer walked in and he read off the charges of vehicle homicide. And he read the names of the victims. And I don't know if there's any words that I can even think of that explain, can explain what I felt inside. To know that the decision that I had made 
or the irresponsible decision that I had made to get behind the wheel that night had taken lives. And, you know, I, I, I have a lot of time to think about those times. And I've been able in the past to trade places with those people for a moment. Not necessarily the victims themselves, but the vicarious victims, the mothers, the fathers. And, and think about well, what if that was my mother and what if that was my daughter or my son that had been killed by someone that was so irresponsible as to get behind the wheel and to drive while they were drinking. You can't, you couldn't blame anyone for actually hating you, despising you. I mean, you, you've taken away what they hold dearest in their life. You've taken that away from them. and. Those children may never have a mother. They may never have a father. Uh, I know how I feel about my children. The mothers and fathers, they, they lost their children. And, and things will never be the same for them again. Yeah. I know that's, uh, that's tough. Uh, it, it's, it's hard as you, as you think back and relive some of the, the events that took place, uh, as I said, on July the 25th, uh, 1990. It, it, uh, it had a, uh, a great devastating uh, effect on, on that family. Uh, and I know also it's had an effect upon your family as well. Oh, yes. Um, tell me a little bit about that as far as uh, uh, how this has affected your family. Yes, I don't want to minimize in the least the seriousness of uh, the victims and their families. I, you know, I, my heart goes out to them each day, even after all these years. Each morning when I wake up, the first thing I think about it is that. But there's other vicarious victims that on, on, on my side of the family, and, and I know to most people that that's insignificant, but they suffer too. My mother, my father. And it wasn't your mother's fault or your father's no, fault. And no, I, and I understand fault. what you're saying there, that... Uh, you know, there was a loss there on, on uh, in their family as well. That, that you know, they didn't uh, didn't make that decision to to drink and to, to get behind the wheel. Uh, so I understand, you know, what you're saying there. There's great loss uh, on the side of the the family that was lost in the accident. Um, but tell me a little bit about uh, how that has affected uh, your own family, because you you can speak from that perspective. I think. Yes, my my children. I, it had a it had a profound effect upon my children, and uh, even though that you know I lived, they still didn't have a father. For for 15 years, my daughter was 13, my son was eight years old, and when I finally came home, my daughter was 28 years old and my son was 24 years old. They did without a father. They didn't have a father figure. They didn't. Uh, they missed so much, you know. Yeah. Of course, and they were innocent victims in this as well. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's it, it, not only that, but the humiliation that they had to suffer. I mean, my, my children had to go to school. They had to be ridiculed by other children that, you know, talking about, I read about your, your father, mm. you know, that's terrible. How could he do such a thing? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's embarrassing and it's humiliating to them. And, and it just makes me wonder, I always wondered, well, how, how can they ever forgive me? But over the years they have forgiven me and I, I'm thankful to God that I have a family that is that forgiven and, and can look past that and know that now that I am, I am trying my very best to live a Christian life to the best of my ability. But my, my daughter was old enough that, and strong enough that she, she carried on. She went on and she, she's lived a much better life than I ever did. Mm -hmm. And I'm so very proud of her. But I've seen a profound effect on my son. He was eight years old. Uh, that's at a time when a father and a son are the closest. I mean, at that particular time, you know, where 
uh, I think he and I were closer than ever. Mm -hmm. And and he he missed he missed me, and I missed him. Yes. And it really had a profound. It made him angry. It, it, it he became angry inside. He he seemed to hate. Blame, wanted to blame everyone else, you know, rather than just me. Mm -hmm. uh, when he got older and became a teenager, then he saw things a little different and did begin, begin to blame me. And, and that's rightly where it belongs. You know, and I, I accept all of that, you know. That's, but over the years, he's a grown man now, and, and I think that through this, that me not be by by me not being there that he he made some smart mistakes of his, own, of his own you know and he has begun to realize through having to deal with those that how I maybe could have made those mistakes and none of them is serious as mine by no means but he understands more and we we are close now we we can be a lot closer than we've ever been but. I don't think anything will ever be the same again, not totally the same as it used to be, or it would have been if I could have been there with them. Well, let's, let's, let's think about that for just a moment. What are some, uh, some things that uh, alcohol has taken away from you? Well, in the beginning, you know, it, alcohol, when recreationally, I think that I'm guilty of wanting to be around those who do the same thing when I was doing it recreationally. And as I, when I had children, I think that going through a divorce, that I used it to numb the pain. And many times that I could have been with my children before uh, more than what I was. I, I was with them quite a bit, but I could have been with them more. And I look back and I see how I wasted time, and I used that time to indulge in the alcohol, the, the partying, and because I was, at that time after a divorce, I was a single man again. So I began to look in that direction, and your kids become they they just get left out altogether, and. I think it just, I just wanted to stay numb all the time. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, then I, I just wasted so much time that I could have had with them. And with my own parents, you know. Uh, I was incarcerated, and during those times, I had a lot of time to lay back and think. And not just about this particular uh, incident, but all the way back to the time where I was 15 and 16 years old, and I don't know if they just anything I could do, and, but there's nothing you can do. You've lost that time. And if there's anyone out there that is doing that kind of thing, I just wish they would think for a moment. I mean, I watched my children grow up in pictures, and it was heartbreaking. I mean, when my daughter, I missed her middle school graduation. I missed her high school graduation. I missed her wedding. Mm. And uh, so it's taken a lot from you. I mean, there's there's no doubt about it. It's had a, uh, a devastating effect on, on on your family as well as the family uh, that was uh, also that was involved in the uh, the car accident. Um, what would you say uh, to a person, Joel, who says, well, you know, I, I hear what happened to Joel, but uh, I can handle my drink, and it's not going to happen to me. Oh, I said that same thing. Yeah. I thought nothing could happen to me. I never saw myself as someone who could be in prison, someone who could be so as irresponsible as to uh, be responsible for someone losing their life. I, I never thought for a moment, ever. And, and so many people, you know, I, I know people now that are older than I, or same age as I, and they went through life, and they've never had uh, 
a, what you call an incident with law enforcement. They've always slid by, they've always gotten by. And I did, I was 32 years old. I'm, you know, I, I had some close calls and, and some minor things happened, but it was never enough to uh, make me say, well, I gotta stop this. You know, it's, it was just a close call. But if you think you're too old, or if you think that the judge is going to have mercy on you. When I was in prison, there were, there's people in there in wheelchairs with no legs, with no arms. And they committed crimes, and they're doing their time. It doesn't matter how old you are. or If you're in your 60s, and this very same thing were to happen to you, and you've gotten by for 30 years, you know, Maybe your kids are grown, but you have grandchildren. And, you know, you love them just as much as your own children. But if you take, you, if you're responsible for taking the life of someone else, this is something that is, is never going to leave you. Maybe there are a few sociopaths in this life, and, you know, that have no feelings. But the majority of people, this is going to haunt you forever. I mean, all these years, I still have, I'm sick to my stomach each day. I'm so sorry. But I don't know what to do. Except the best I can do now, and be a better person than I've ever been, a better Christian. For my children, but if there's just anything I could do, I just wish I could go back, but it's not possible. It, it's not possible, and we understand that. But I do want, again, to commend you, Joel, uh, for having the willingness to sit down and talk about uh, something that is so sensitive and, and an event that was so tragic. What a sobering and life-altering story we've just heard. Truly, wine is a mocker, and those that are deceived by it are not wise. In our program next week, we're going to continue our interview with Joel Godfrey as he tells us about his life in prison following his conviction. And then as Joel offers a heartfelt plea to those who are watching to not make the same mistakes that he made. So join us next week for part two of A Night to Never Forget. And so for the Jackson Heights Church of Christ in Florence, Alabama, I'm Barry Gilreath, your host, wishing you and your family the Lord's blessings and providential care until we meet again. <laughs>